This morning's scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, beginning at verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give them your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, my son Michael was going to a youth workers convocation in Atlanta put on by a group, Youth Specialties. And I was talking to Michael and I said, what are you looking forward to? And he said, the speakers. And I said, well, who will the speakers be? He said, one of them is one of your old favorites, Dad, Tony Campolo. I said, good. But he said, there's a new face and there's a new voice. His name is Shane Claiborne, and I really want to hear him. So Michael got back, and a week later we were talking. And I said, well, how did it go? And how, what was this Shane Claiborne like? And he said, well, it was kind of interesting. The um, place was packed. Everybody wanted to hear him three, four deep standing in the back of the auditorium. Claiborne, he said, comes out and he says, I'm going to now um, share with you the most stirring sermon ever preached. And he opened the Bible and he started reading from Matthew 5. We heard portions of this here this morning. And he said, about three or four minutes into it, people were elbowing each other saying, He's going to read the whole thing. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, that's what he did. Michael said, um, with no dramatic overtones, no embellishment stylistically or substantively, he just read through the Sermon on the Mount, he finished, he closed the book, and he walked off the stage. That was it. <laughs> I said, well, how did people take it? He said, well, some were a little flabbergasted. You mean that's, that's it? It's over? Some people felt a little... Well, a little ripped off. They had paid big money to go to this convocation, and he was one of the headliners. And yes, nothing wrong with the Sermon on the Mount, but they wanted to hear some new seminal thoughts, and that's all they get. I said, well, what did you think, Michael? He said, it was my highlight of the weekend. I said, well, why? He said, because I've never heard the entire sermon front to back one big gulp. And I said, well, what did you hear? And he said, what I heard like I've never heard before was how hard this strikes against what makes sense in our world. Hmm. I wasn't lost on Michael. It wasn't lost on Jesus. I mean, Jesus knew when he was saying these things that he was not coloring in the lines, okay? He was outside the lines. He was outside the lines of straight line, dupes paying morality. When he gets to the end of the section that you heard today, Jesus is not asked the question, well, what are you doing? He says, no, what, I want to know what more are you doing? What more are you doing than the norm, than others? You remember what we're doing here during Lent? We're letting Jesus be the master questioner. That's the question that is going to hang in the air here. What, what more are you doing than others? He said, oh, you know, this is what most people do. I mean, if someone greets them warmly, they are hospitable back. He said, where's the stretch in that? 
if, if you're generous to people that have already been generous to you, my goodness, he said, tax collectors, you can count on them to do that. If you're good to the people that are good to you, where's the grace in that? Do you know the most often used phrase in the entire Sermon on the Mount was one that got repeated again and again. It wasn't Jesus saying, now go and do this or don't do that. The most often repeated phrase was this. You have heard it said, but. So Jesus knew his crowd. It's kind of like this crowd. I mean, these were people trying to figure out this Jesus way. I mean, they knew their world. They knew the mores, the traditions, the customs. They knew the um, predictable rules for the road. Jesus said, no, we're not talking about that. He said, you've heard it said, but. You've heard it said, don't murder, but, but I tell you, do not carry enmity or avarice in your heart or call a sister or brother fool. You've heard it said that revenge is practical. The standard procedure is to match injury with injury. But I tell you, the real practicality is if somebody pops you on one cheek, go on and offer up the other one. You've heard it said, hate your enemies. But I tell you, if someone has something against you, that's the very one that you were to favor and to go and work for their well-being. You've heard it said that when uh, you're reaching an agreement, to go out and swear an oath and make it official. But I tell you, be a person of integrity. You don't have to swear an oath. Just let your yes be yes. On and on. You've heard it said, but I say. Now, if you want to get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it's the end of the seventh chapter of Matthew. You go there. You know what you're going to hear is the, um, the reviews of the crowd, okay? You know what their review was? They turned to each other and they said, we have never heard anybody talk like this before. They were puzzled. We're still puzzled. It says they were astonished. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Can some of you remember back, I think it was in the 1970s, rumor got around our country that we were going to shift to the metric system. Do you remember that? Let's talk about that. Well, I lived in Florida, and Florida decided to experiment with that a little bit to see how it was going to work. And they tried it with some signage on the major roads and interstates. Now, I guess it was in the newspaper. I missed it. I missed the memorandum. But I do remember getting out there on I-4 and I saw this sign, which was one of the most encouraging signs I had seen in a long time. Speed limit, 88. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I had this Malibu, 350 cubic inches, <laughs> heavy foot, and I knew you could always be given at least 10 miles over, right? <laughs> 88 becomes 98. I felt like I was driving on a German Autobahn, you know, and wind was up my back. I was hammering down. And then I got to the third sign, third time I saw the sign, speed limit sign, and then I saw it down there in the right-hand corner beneath the numbers, KMH. Oh, my goodness, not miles per hour. It's <laughs> kilometers. Here. Here I was moving around in a whole new standard of measurement, you see, and I just, I wasn't accustomed to it. That's what Jesus is doing. He's pushing on the standard measurement of ethics. He knows who he's talking to. He's, he, he knows these people. Some of them know the Torah inside out. It's inscribed not just on their head, but in their heart. But he says, look, I want you to stay with me. I want you to go with me to the end of this sermon because by the time we're finished here today, you're going to know just how odd it is to be the people of God. Hmm. I wonder how this sermon plays into contemporary ears. Well, I'll tell you. True story, some years back, preacher, you know, he is preaching very similar sermon to what you're going to hear today. Gets into the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies. Well, after church, he's standing out there and he sees a man coming out. Looks kind of serious, not real happy, fevered brow. And he says, are you okay? And he says, not really. He said, what's wrong? He said, your sermon. He said, you, you, you said some things that um, 
I don't think I really wanted to hear. He's, and, and the preacher says, I can understand that. I didn't want to hear some of it either. A lot of this was Jesus' idea. Man says, well, I don't care. You make the choice, and you chose the Scripture. Bad choice. <laughs> uh, well, I know. It's, it's kind of hard. Look, preacher, we, we come here to church to have an hour or so to feel pretty good about ourselves. And don't, don't keep doing this. You're, you're raising the bar too high, too high. Okay. Um, you keep that up. We're not going to have church. We're just going to be one of those little cinder block, nothing, nothing churches. Look, I don't want to say here this morning I'm completely unsympathetic to what that man was saying. I mean, I mean really, in so many ways, Jesus is raising the bar awfully high here. You know, it really is. This is one of the most breathtaking reversals you're ever going to hear of normal human values. This is a jarring judgment of the way we as human beings tend to organize the world. This is really a um, relentless stripping away from the chest of our pride of all those medals we think we've achieved in the fine art of living. Okay. I, I can understand why somebody would say the bar is too high, but here, here's what I don't understand. Where do we think the promise for humanity, to be, humanity is to be found when we keep the bar really low. Isn't that what we do? I mean, yeah, you, you, you be good to people that are good to you. Oh, that's really creative. <laughs> yeah. That's really kept the world together. Oh, you just be good to those who are good to you. If somebody's bad to you, just give it back double-fold, tenfold. Yeah. I know a woman, uh, she's in her 60s. And she has never gotten over what happened in her home growing up. She said, we had, there were six of us. She said, I was six, seven years old, and the most wonderful time of every day was supper time. We'd get together around the supper table, and the kids, we'd talk about what happened at school, and the parents would talk about their work and what was going on in the news, and it was the most wonderful time of the day. But then one, one evening at supper time, my parents got into it. They got into it big time. Faces were reddened, there was screaming, and we walked in and they shut it down, and my mother threw a few plates on to the table and said, let's eat, and nothing else was said the entire meal. Next night, let's eat, no talk, no speak. Next night, it was that way for two weeks, nobody said a thing at the table. Finally, finally we started talking again after two weeks, and every once in a while it was civil, but she said, most of the time, mom, dad, Snipe here, snipe here, backbite here, get back there. She said they never dealt with it, and we were never the same again. Yeah, let's keep the bar low. That, that, that's, that's our way of doing it, right? We know a lot better than God. That's, that's our way to let, Let's keep the bar really low. And everybody gets on this escalator ride of revenge and retaliation that never lets anybody off. Well... Jesus is saying these words to us, and I don't see him having any sense that this is going to make good sense to everybody. I, I, I don't see him preaching this as though a, a lot of people are just going to go along with this. The only thing that really makes him commend this to his listeners is he says, this is the way of our Heavenly Father, period. He said, this is the way life is. This is the way God is. This is what God does. Why do you think we're called to bless both our enemies and our friends? Because we have a clement father who sees that the good rain falls on the just and the unjust. This is the character of God, and our character is to be shaped by that character. He's saying, look, don't let the character of somebody else's behavior determine yours. Do those who reject you determine your life? No. Do those who um, accept you determine your life? No. Do your friends determine your life? No. Do your enemies determine your life? No. God is gracious to the unkind and the ungrateful. And, 
And we're to be followers. Let that character be our character. I know some people hear this, these teachings that you heard today from the Sermon on the Mount, and they say, my goodness, God is asking us to be a doormat, to be weak, to let people just run all over us. No, this is the teaching of strength and character. Um, if someone slaps you on the left cheek, don't go over in the corner and just say, oh, poor me, I'm a, a part of the company of the slapped. No, no. You, you say, here's another cheek. You, you do that to take control of your life and your behavior. If anyone, if anyone sues you for your coat, j just go on and say, here's my shirt to go with it. You take the initiative. If a Roman soldier going back to his barracks, who's weary of carrying heavy armor all day, says, Hey, you Jew, law says you have to carry my pack a mile. You pick that pack up and you carry it a mile. And at the end of the mile, you say, Hey, friend, I'm carrying this for you all the way home, all the way back to the barracks. Don't let the quality of somebody else's character and behavior determine yours. No, you determine your life out of the dignity and worth that belongs to the fact that you're made in the image of God. Okay. So here Jesus is, I mean, pushing out in front of us this ethic that sometimes seems for all the world like an impossible ethic. But wait a minute. If this is the way God is, if this is what God does, and we're made in that image, doesn't it follow that just maybe this is where the deepest joy is to be found? The joy of sailing true north as a human being, what we're made for, not just for our sake, but for the sake of others. The joy of helping the world discover that survival of the fittest, dog eat dog, that's not at the heart of the universe. Helping the world to see that forgiveness and peace and grace, that's the rhythm at the heart of the universe. Uh, isn't there kind of a just strong impulse in this to, to be a part of something that, well, we wouldn't have come up to if left to our own devices? Isn't there something to be said about the glory of a faith we can't quite live up to? A faith and a life that is always stretching our ethical boundaries and comes back the next day and asks for a little something more. It was Eugene Ormandy, he was the director of the Philadelphia Symphony, and a patron comes up one night after the concert and says, how come you never play any of my favorite songs? And, and he said, ma'am, you need to know that this orchestra dares to play music that really can't be played. Okay. Now sometimes, sometimes I can get a hold of that just Life hangs together by being everlastingly aimed at something out in front of me calling me forward. Sometimes I can get a hold of that. But I have found what you've also found, that there are times that I have bruised the knuckles of my soul on not quite being able to live into these teachings. Now I promise you, before we get to Easter, in this sanctuary, you're going to hear a word of absolute forgiveness and grace that helps us pick up our broken pieces and brush ourselves off and get going again. But you know what I want us to do here today? I, I want us to let Jesus and his word just stay and stand here in the room to hear for all that he said. But as we do that, I, I want to make sure you don't forget to picture the Jesus behind these words. Who is this Jesus? I mean, this, this isn't one who came to condemn the world. This is one who came to love an old world into a new world. What's he doing here in these teachings? He's loving us as usual. He's loving us too much to make it sound easier than it is. He, he loves us too much to let us be satisfied with something less than abundant life. Why are we here today? To, because surprise of surprise, this Holy One has sought us and claimed us and called us and loved us too much not to tell us the truth. Okay. 
I hope before Lent is over, before you get to Easter, that you'll give this Sermon of the Mount a full reading, one big gulp. But if you do that, I want you to make sure as you're hearing these words, you try to look into the face and the eyes of Jesus. Well, we lived in Shelby. Our children were, um, were young. Good news for our children. They had a wonderful mom. I mean, she, she was a supreme nurturer, and she was the, you know, during those years, the, 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 the primary one who was present and giving care and advice and counsel. And, uh, but, but, I, but I still had a role, and every once in a while I was reminded that I did. Okay. You know, there would be ways of, I'm, I would get the message, it was my turn, right, my turn. Well, you know how it is, parents, when you come home, you, you walk into the door, and within 30 seconds, you know how things have gone. You can just feel the atmosphere and the climate. Sometimes you walk in, and everything is just as cool as the backside of the pillow. It's just so nice. Everybody's just getting along. Sometimes you walk in, whew, you can feel the heat. Well, this particular day I walked in, I, I could tell something had not gone well. And surprise to surprise, little angelic Carrie had actually acted out of bounds and she had been insulting and mean to one of her brothers. And I was told she was at the room in the back of the house and she was waiting for me. Yeah. It was my turn. Well, you know that you've been around me enough, I enjoy words and trying to get words together and the right words at the right time. And it was a long hallway and I was walking down there crafting, you know, my little parent riot speech. I did notice that Sarah was following me. I did not take that as a vote of confidence. <laughs> and so I get there and let me tell you, it was good stuff. I unloaded verse one, two, three of what we expected in terms of behavior. It was, it was so good. I wish I'd had a notepad because I wanted to take notes on, on myself and what I was saying. So I get to the end of the stern and challenging message. And Carrie looked up at me and said, Hi, Dad. I'm so glad you're home. <laughs> I look over my shoulder, and I just shrug my shoulders because Sarah's watching all this. And I just said, well, I did my best. And she said, well, what did you expect? I said, what do you mean? She said, all she had to do was look into your face and know that you didn't mean half of what you said. <laughs> all right. Now, this is an imperfect illustration of what I'm trying to say. Oh, Rob, are you saying when Jesus gave us all these challenging ethical demands that he didn't mean what he said? No. What Jesus felt, he thought. What he thought, he said. And what he said, he meant to say because he was a truth teller. But if you listen behind the words... And you look into that face, you're not going to see someone who is trying to turn us off or turn us away. He's trying to turn us to an expression of abundant life, a way to be more and more of what we are. And also so other people can do the same. Yeah. So yeah, you, you, you take the Sermon on the Mount home with you this way. You, you read all three of those chapters, you take it in in one big gulp, it'll probably take your breath away. But don't walk away from it. You know, just know that this is the way that's put before us. So you get up in the morning and you're with your face upward and your feet forward. You, you do your best to put your feet on this path, knowing, trusting that the one who has showed us this way will be there with the grace to always finish in us what we can't always finish by ourselves. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for loving the world enough to not let us be satisfied or content with something less than life. 
less than what you had in mind for us and for all humanity. So come, Lord Jesus. Open our ears and open our hearts and show us a way to put our feet on the path toward life. Amen. Thank you.